Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we are going to start the development of the year. So all of you know that, that we have got three different parts of the year, external year, middle year, and the internal year. The year forms a single anatomical unit for both hearing and the equilibrium. And all these three, the external, middle, and the internal ear, they have got the separate origin. The external ear for sound collection, the middle ear for sound conduction, and the internal ear that converts the sound wave to nerve impulses and reach the changes in the equilibrium. So if we see the development of the ear, it begins at the 22nd days of life, intraeternal life, and here you can see this is the rhombine cephalon. This thickening of the surface acted down of the rhombine cephalon on each end. And this thickening is known as the otic placard. And this thickening, it will invaginate and ultimately they will uh, form the otic pit. And this otic pit, finally, it will form the otic vesicles. And each vesicle divides into two components. One is ventral component and other one is the dorsal component. The ventral component gives rise to the sicil and the cochlear duct and the dorsal component forms the utricle, semicircular canals and the endolymphatic duct. So here you can see this is the otic vesicle here. This is the cochlear part and this is the vestibular part. This is the secular part. This is the utricular part here. And ultimately, this secular part, the ventral part, it will give rise to the sequel and the cochlear duct, and the uh, dorsal part, it will give rise to utricle and these three semicircular canals. These are the three semicircular canals. This one, this one, this one. This is utricle. This is uh, your sequel, and this is the duct of the cochlea. And the communication between the sequel and the cochlear duct, that is known as the ductus reunionis. So coming to the sequel, cochlea, and the organ of corti. Here, in the sixth week of development, the sequel forms a tubular outpocketing. This is the secular part. This is the utricular part. This secular part, it will form an outpocketing here. And this outpocketing is at the lower part. This outgrowth, that, that is known as the cochlear duct, penetrates the surrounding mesenchyme in a spiral manner until the end of A2. And it will complete the two and half turns. The connection to the remaining portion of the sequel is confined to a narrow pathway that is known as the ductus reunions. You can see here, this is the ductus reunions. This is the communication between the sequel and the cochlear duct. This is the cochlear duct and this is the sequel here. The mesenchyme surrounding the cochlea duct differentiate into cartilage. Here you can see this is the cochlea duct and this is the cartilage. At the ten to it, the cartilage near cell undergoes speculation and the perilymphatic spaces form. These are known as the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. So here you can see this is the cartilage near spur, there is vesiculation occurs and ultimately this is scala vestibuli and this is scala tympani. These two perilymphatic sacs are formed and <coughs> the cochlea is separated from the scala vestibuli. This is scala vestibuli, this is cochlea duct. This scala vestibuli is separated from the cochlea duct by a membrane that is known as the vestibular membrane and from the scala tympani there is a membrane that is known as the basilar membrane. The lateral wall, this is the lateral wall. The lateral wall of the duct remains attached to the surrounding cartilage by a ligament that is known as the spiral ligament. Here you can see the spiral ligament is there. The median angle is connected and partially supported by the cartilage process. This is the median angle of the cochlear duct. It is supported by the cartilage process. And this part is known as the modulus. Modulus, the fusor axis of the bony cochlea. Initially, the cells of the cochlea duct are alike. Later, they form two ridges the inner ridge 
the fusel spiral limbus and the outer ridge. So here you can see this is inner ridge and this is the outer ridge. The outer ridge, it will form one row of inner and three or four rows of the outer hair cells. Here you can see this is, this is inner single layer cells and the outer three or four layers of the hair cells. You can see here nicely this is inner ridge, this is outer ridge. The outer ridge, the inner part, it will form a single layer of cells and here on the outer part, it will form three or four layers of the cells. And they are covered by a membrane that is known as the tectorial membrane. Here you can see, this is the tectorial membrane. You can this diagram, you can see these hair cells, they are covered by a membrane that is known as the tectorial membrane, this one. So the sensory cells and the tectorial membrane, together they constitute the organ of cortex. The impulses received by the organ of party transmitted to the spiral ganglion, then to the nervous system by the auditory fibers of the cranial nerve 8, that is your vestibular cochlear nerve. Then coming to the utricle and the semicircular canals. Uh, during sixth week of development, the semicircular canals appears as flattened or pocketing of the utricular part of the otic vesicle. This is the utricular part of the otic vesicle here. The central portion of the walls of these alpogenings oppose each other and disappear, giving rise to the semicircular canals. This is the opposing part of the central part, and ultimately they will give rise to these three semicircular canals. So these semicircular canals they have got two ends, one end and the other end. So one end of these semicircular canals they will dilate. That is known as the crust ampullary, and the other end they do not dilate, and they are known as the crust non ampullary. So, these three crust non ampullary, two of them will fuse, and ultimately, what will happen? There will be five end of the semicircular canal three crust ampullary and two crust non ampullary. So cells in the ampulla, in the ampulla region, they will form a crest that is known as the crista ampullaris, containing sensory cells for the maintenance of the equilibrium. So similar sensory areas, the macular acoustica, develop in the wall of the utricle and the secure. And the impulses generated in the sensory cells due to change in the body position is carried to the brain by the vestibular fibers of the cranial nerve 8. And during formation of the otic vesicles, a group of cells break away to form the stetoacoustic ganglion. The other cells of the ganglion are derived from the neural crest. The ganglion subsequently splits into cochlea and the vestibular portion which supplies sensory cells of the organ of Corti and those of the sickle, utricle, and the semicircular canals. So this is the development of the internal ear. Coming to the middle ear, the tympanic cavity and the auditory tube. The tympanic cavity originates in the endoderm derived from the first pharyngeal pouch. Here you can see the first pharyngeal pouch in this one, and this is the first pharyngeal cleft. This pouch, it expands in the lateral direction, expands in the lateral direction, come in contact with the floor of the, sorry, uh, uh, come in contact with the floor of the first pharyngeal cleft and distal part of the pouch that is known as the tubo tympanic recess. This is the distal part of the pouch, this is known as the tubo tympanic recess and widens and give rise to the primitive tympanic cavity. So this part will be distal part of the pouch will be converted to the primitive tympanic cavity and the proximal part it remains narrow and form the auditory tube. The proximal part will form the auditory tube here you can see or the eustachian tube and through this eustachian tube the tympanic cavity communicates with the nasopharynx. 
Then coming to the ossicles, the malleus, incus, and the stipes. There are three ossicles in the ear. The malleus and incus derive from the cartilage of the first pharyngeal arch and the stipes from the second arch. They appear in the first half of fetal life but remain embedded in the mesenchyme until eight months. The surrounding tissue dissolves. The epithelium of the primitive tympanic cavity extends along the wall of the newly formed space. The tympanic cavity is now two times larger, larger than its original size. The ossicles are free of mesenchyme. Endodermal epithelium can extend to the wall of the cavity. So here you can see these are the three ossicles, malleus, incus, and the stipes. This is the external auditory canal. This is the tympanic cavity here. Then the supporting ligaments of the ossicles, they develop in the later period. Malleus there from the first arch, its muscle, that is your tensor tympanic muscle, is innervated by mandibular nerve. That is the runs from the trigeminal nerve and the stapedius muscle as it is derived from the second nerve attached to the stapes, it is innervated by the facial nerve. In the late fetal life, the tympanic cavity expands dorsally by vacuolation of surrounding tissue to form the tympanic antrum. So after what? The epithelium of the tympanic cavity invades the bone of developing gastric process and the epithelium line air sac are formed, that is known as the pneumatization. Later, most of the air sac come in contact with the antrum and the tympanic cavity. So here is the this is the external auditory meters, these are the ossicles, malia, syncus, and the stopies. And these are the semicircular canals, and this is the cochlea here. You can see in this diagram very nicely. So, coming to the next part, that is your external ear, development of external ear. That is, external auditory meters develops from the dorsal portion of the first pharyngeal cleft. This is the first pharyngeal cleft, dorsal portion of the first pharyngeal cleft. At the beginning of the third month, the epithelial cells at the bottom of the meatus proliferate, forming a solid epithelial plate that is known as the meatal plug. So here you can see this is the cleft, phosphorangeal cleft. Here you will find the proliferation of the tissues and there will be formation of the solid epithelial plate and ultimately it will form a plug that is known as the metal plug. At the seventh month, the plug dissolves and the epithelium of the floor of the meatus participate in formation of the definitive eardrum. The metal plug may persist leading to the congenital deafness. If the metal plug does not dissolve in due time, then there will be congenital deafness of the children. Then coming to the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is made up of ectodermal epithelial lining at the bottom of auditory meters. Then endodermal lining of tympanic cavity and the intermediate layer of the connective tissue. So you will have three layers, three sources of origin for the tympanic membrane, the ectoderm, endoderm as well as the mesoderm. The major part is attached to the handle of the malleus and the remaining portion forms the separation between the external auditory meters and the tympanic cavity. Then, lastly, the auricle. The auricle develops from the six mesal female proliferation at the dorsal end of the first and second pharyngeal arches surrounding the first pharyngeal cleft. So around the first pharyngeal cleft, we will get six mesenchymal proliferations. And out of these six, three will be on each side of the external meter. And these are known as the auricular hillocks. These auricular hillocks, 
they will fuse with each other and form the definitive auricle. And this process of fusion of the auricular healer is very complicated. As a result, the development of the auricle, developmental defects of the auricle is very common. And initially the external ear, it develops in the neck region and later on it ascends upwards and ultimately it is set on the level of the eye on either side of the face. So this is the development of the ear, the internal, external and the middle ear. And next coming to the clinical part. The hearing loss and the external ear anomalies. The congenital hearing loss is caused by the abnormal development of the membranes and the bony labyrinth or by malformation of the auditory ossicles and the ear drum. In extreme cases, the tympanic cavity and the external meatus may be absent. Many types of congenital hearing loss is caused by genetic factors. The environmental factors also may interfere with normal development of the internal and the medullia. There are some viruses like the rubella and the cytomegalovirus infections during pregnancy may also cause hearing loss to the newborn. One medicine that is known as the isotretinoin, that is a teratos, teratogen and it is mostly used in the dermatology, may cause variety of ear defects if it is taken during the period of pregnancy. The external ear defects are common. It may be minor or severe. They cause psychological and emotional trauma to the individuals. They serve as clues to examine the newborn for other abnormalities. If a child is born with some ear problems, or developmental defects in the external ear or the auricle. We have to see the other congenital abnormalities as it may be a clue for underlying congenital abnormalities. And most of the commotion syndromes have ear abnormalities as one of their characteristic features. There's another abnormality that is known as the preauricular appendages or pins. They have skin text and a shallow depression anterior to the ear. Pin indicates abnormal development of the auricular hillocks and the appendages may be caused by accessory hillocks. And both may be stayed with some other malformations. So this is about the development of the year. Thank you.